Good morning. This is a talk on the basics of dynamo theory. Uh, yesterday, you had Dana Longcope give you an introductory lecture on why there are magnetic fields on Earth, the planets, the sun, and other astrophysical objects. Today, I'll go into this very same subject uh, a little bit more in depth. Um, and also complementing what was a good introduction from yesterday. So let's begin by taking stock uh, of uh, magnetic fields in the universe. By the way, I should add very quickly that quite a lot of this material is one that I adapted from the talk given by Matthias Rempel, who actually works here. Is an expert on MHD and sunspots. And I stole a number of slides from him with his permission, of course. Uh, the reason is, of course, for some reason of continuity as well, because uh, Matthias's chapter in volume one of the heliophysics textbooks is uh, dominantly the material I cover. But I've added a few additional things as well. So. Getting back to magnetic fields in the universe, you know the Earth has a magnetic field that's been around for three and a half billion years, much longer than the ohmic decay time. By ohmic decay time, you heard yesterday that the Earth has a liquid core. Um, if you just look at the resistivity of that liquid core and calculate how much time it would take for the magnetic field to diffuse away. That's 10,000 years. The Earth's magnetic field has also short-term variability of the order of 1,000 years. I mention this feature, as I will for other objects, because that is what falls on scientific ideas like the dynamo to account for these large-scale magnetic fields. Planets, Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune have large scale fields. Venus does not. And then I told you yesterday the differences that there are in the cores of these planets as opposed to that of Venus. The sun, magnetic fields from smallest observable scales to size of sun. The sun's magnetic field has this remarkable feature, one of the most well-known features of the solar magnetic field, the 11-year-old cycle of the large-scale field. The ohmic decay time of that one is 10 to the power 9 years. So you would think it's not all that off, really, um, but still smaller. And, and this is in the absence of turbulence. So we still have a, 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 a real challenge in trying to understand even these time scales. There are other stars, stars with outer convection zones similar to the sun, stars with outer radiation zones. Most likely, these are primordial fields. And I explain that notion a little later. Data talk, touched upon these stars in yesterday's talk as well. And then, of course, on the much larger scale of galaxies, you have field structure coupled to observed matter distributions, as for example, spiral. And these are micro gas fields, well known to astrophysicists who have made measurements, uh, not by, of course, direct in situ probing, because they can't at those distances. But nonetheless, they're indirect inferences. Do we need an animal for that? Or can that be understood from? the fact that it's primordial. In some of these cases, uh, the, there are judgment calls to be made as to whether the fields are primordial or not. Because I cannot say that in every object that you consider, uh, these discrepancies between the so-called diffusion time and the life of the object is so incommensurate as to necessarily require a dynamo. But the preponderance of evidence definitely is that we need something in the nature of a universal mechanism, which may vary from object to object, because these objects 
contain plasmas of vastly different properties. But nonetheless, one that will try to explain why we have magnetic fields. So here comes a really serious question, uh, 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 and a searing question, too. Why is the universe magnetized? When I first went to graduate school, uh, I remember uh, the large-scale structure of space-time by Stephen Hawking and George Ellis uh, was a book that was becoming available, talking about a few decades ago now. And I remember the first line of that book says, the universe began a finite time ago. And it sort of gave me a chill to just read that line because I thought there was so much of religion, including one of my own that I grew up with, which told me the universe existed forever. And it took science to tell us that no, the universe began a finite time ago. And that there are definite things we know today that rule out that the universe has been around forever. Science tells you things that are very specific, that are indisputable, that probably challenge lots of things that we know about. To my mind, actually, a plasma physicist, why is the universe magnetized is as thrilling a question to ponder as the question of why the universe began a finite time ago. And in a way, the problem that we are addressing today, the whole question of the dynamo, is a problem deeply fundamental because we now know from the examples I gave you that all these objects have large-scale magnetic fields. And if you want to take one clean cut through all of it, you would come to the conclusion that we need to understand how these magnetic fields are sustained. So I began by telling you about Dana's lecture. And he pointed out to you that there are three fundamental features. He emphasized to you that, as opposed to non-plasma physicists who might think of charge separation and the like, that's not nearly what is at the heart of uh, this dynamo. It's usually some form of electrically conducting fluid. The fluid must have complex motions. And the motions must be vigorous enough, as measured by the magnetic Reynolds number, which is a dimensionless number. Velocity, size, divided by resistivity. And it went into some depth the so-called homopolar dynamo, which really is a toy example. It's worth going through that toy example because it captures some of the essential physics uh, of the more complicated dynamos that we'll be dealing with today, especially the turbulent dynamo. But I won't repeat all of that. You've had an exposure to that, and that is that. And as I said, the references for this lecture are drawn from the heliophysics textbooks Volume 1, Chapter 3 by Matthias Rempel. A lot of my talk is drawn from that. There's another in Volume 3 by Paul Charbonneau, and another in Volume 4 by Stanley. And after my talk, there will be another talk by Nick Featherstone, who is also here, and will tell you about things that are broader, planetary dynamos, stellar dynamos, and so on and so forth. But this is where I would like to go into uh, the theoretical foundations of the subject. So uh, I should let you know that I am excluding from this lecture a very interesting set of laboratory experiments on dynamos. They are based on either a liquid metal, and in the case of another, a plasma dynamo experiment at the University of Wisconsin at Madison that is presently led by Kerry Forrest. These laboratory dynamos are trying to attempt to study under controlled laboratory conditions some of these mechanisms that we study. Uh, some of them are actually MHD systems because they're liquid metal systems. On the other hand, the dynamo experiment at the University of Wisconsin-Madison is a plasma dynamo. The reason I mention that is because even though MHD is the dominant model to be used in this lecture, Beware of the limitations of the MHD model, too. 
you saw a striking example of that in Stuart Bale's last lecture, where he was actually emphasizing to you that as solar probe, the Parker solar probe goes closer and closer to the sun, he will be looking at kinetic features which are not describable by the MHD model. And therefore, a good question that you can ask me is, how much can you rely on the MHT model itself to capture the essential features of dynamo, especially the solar dynamo, uh, which if you look at what Stuart was telling you about from the corona outward, there are significant kinetic features. I am not obviously discussing that aspect of the problem. I'm trying to get to the heart of what produces the sun's magnetic field or the earth's magnetic field. And the sun does have a plasma in it. And it seems that for the plus problems that I'll be discussing, MHT is a good model. But by no means should you assume that MHT is the beginning and the end of the dynamo question. Because the whole issue of are there kinetic descriptions of the dynamo? The same mechanism, large scale magnetic field production by turbulence, is a whole field unto itself. And it's a growing and interesting field in which very few results are known. There are some results known from computer simulations, but I wouldn't necessarily mistake those for understanding at a basic theoretical level. So it's good for you to know that there are some very large unsolved problems out there. With that apology, I will get back to the MHT theory, which is today's uh, lecture about. And I do want to show you what these basic equations are about. This is well known to some of you. In fact, in uh, Nick's laboratory yesterday, when you were looking at the predictions of a number of models, People do have global models making sense of some of the large scale features of storms, for example. These are often based on an MHT model or variants of it. Though it is quite clear that when you go out to the Earth's magnetosphere that you are breaking away from the traditional MHT model. Nonetheless, the model itself has great strengths because it describes certain remarkable large scale some large scale features with remarkable accuracy, it really does break down in small scales. And since we will be focusing a bit on large scale features, perhaps we can get away with the MHD model. So to begin, uh, with no apologies, this is the continuity equation for MHD, mass conservation. How many of you have had some exposure to MHD? That's about half. So let me just say a couple of things. And how many of you know about hydrodynamics or fluid dynamics? About the same number. So thinking of fluids and plasmas as continuum objects, by which I mean you know, plasmas have various levels of description. You can think of them at the single particle level, or you can think of them as fluid. And then if you refine your microscope further, you get into what I would call kinetic theory. MHT is a self-consistent model, a powerful one at that, which is at the fluid level, where the agglomeration of charged particles, ions, and electrons that describe as a single fluid as if they move together. And actually, we know in a lot of space systems, ions and electrons do have their individual dynamics. So MHT would miss some of these things. But nonetheless, in its ability to actually capture the large scale motions of the plasma fluid, it does a remarkably good job. So the first one is the mass continuity equation. Rho is the density. This is the momentum equation. I do recognize things like the plasma pressure, gravity. And a characteristic feature of plasmas is that there is what is called the Lorentz force, the J cross B term that controls large scale motions. This term is a viscosity term. I'll talk about it in the next slide. Just an introduction to you here. Then comes the energy, which is often also written as an equation for the pressure. So you could think of this uh, as an equation for the pressure, essentially. Whether you write it for energy, it combines magnetic and fluid energy, or you just write an equation for pressure, is really a matter of taste. 
So this is uh, the equation that you look at. This is thermal conduction. This is heat due to viscosity. This is ohmic dissipation terms. And then you have this equation, which is written in red, and for good reason in this talk, because it will be the point of departure for a lot of what dynamo theory was about. How do you generate magnetic fields and systems due to large scale velocity motion of the plasma fluid? In the very beginning, when people started working on dynamo theory, they did not want to deal with the full complexity of MHD equations. They actually started from this equation, which is known as the induction equation. If it were only a solid conductor, you would not have a plasma velocity term. And many of you who have taken electricity and magnetism courses at the level of a Jackson or even a more elementary uh, course know that in conductors, magnetic fields can diffuse if they have finite conductivity or dissipation. And in plasmas, that is complicated by the presence of this large scale motion. So as I was saying, uh, one assumption underlying all these equations is that the plasma is like a continuum fluid. There are enough particles per cubic centimeter or per unit volume to allow the MHT picture to be good. Now, if you think of the Earth's magnetosphere or the Earth's magnetotail, sometimes there's one particle per centimeter cube. It does give you pause on how good the MHD model can be. What is remarkable is that despite that question that you would rightly ask, the large scale features of the magnetosphere are described remarkably well by the continuum equations, but it will break down at small scales. And this, of course, assumes non-relativistic motions and also low frequencies, the kind of frequencies that Stuart Bale was talking about, where anisotropic heating can occur, omega of the order of omega cyclotron, which is something that you do see when you go out to the corona, not too far away, where you're beginning to see ions being heated through probably cyclotron resonances are completely outside of the scope of the MHD model because MHD implicitly assumes that all frequencies are much smaller than the cyclotron frequencies. Uh, and by the way, the models that he described to you, the turbulence models of Sridhar and Goldreich and so on and so forth. They're all based on this MHG picture. And we all know that there are many more frequencies that are involved in, in turbulence near the solar corona than just low frequencies. So you should be aware of what we get right and what we get wrong when we use MHG theory. So I want to flesh out the picture for you here. There is this viscous stress tensor that is defined here. The details are not important. It just is that I wanted to make clear that we have a handle on what these various terms are. And I was telling you that energy equation is really equation for the plasma pressure, uh, which you could write for E. But again, whether it is P or E, they're equivalent, at least in that sense. And here, nu, eta, and kappa are the viscosity, magnetic diffusivity, and thermal conductivity, mu zero denotes the permeability of vacuum. Uh, I should point out to you that in addition to the Reynolds number, there is in fact another number dimensionless that's very important. That's the Prandtl number. That's usually the ratio of the viscous coefficient nu and eta. It's a real challenge for simulations to do either high or low Prandtl number studies. Most simulation studies typically do Prandtl number one type of simulations. And therefore, a good question is, when you look at the results of the simulations, how valid are they for the real astrophysical environments? And that remains an open question in research. And we are all extrapolating in regimes where we can do theory and simulation to actual environments where we are clearly violating the assumptions of our theory and simulations. So take all of this with a grain of salt. And when I tell you that we understand something, keep in mind that the regime of our understanding is limited. Now, getting back to the induction equation, which I promised you I would deal with, uh, I, I wrote down this form of the equation. But it is good to backtrack a little and realize that uh, initially, in ideal MHD, the law was that E plus V cross B equals 0. 
that law does not allow for any parallel electric field in the system parallel to the magnetic field. But when you have dissipation, or like a finite conductivity, you get an additional term. This is, in fact, the term that is sometimes written as eta j, or you can write it in terms of conductivity. Uh, that's, again, uh, a matter of taste. But this is the form of the equation that is obtained by taking the curl of this equation and using Maxwell, whereby you've eliminated E from the problem. E is by no means 0. E has just been eliminated in favor of the magnetic field. And you can always go back and reconstruct the electric field once you know the magnetic field from this equation. Are you guys all with me? Please feel free to stop me if anything you do not understand. I'm deliberately going slowly because I want to keep you with me as I go. Getting back to this induction equation from where I want to begin our journey on dynamos, you can non-dimensionalize the entire equation by scaling b to some characteristic large scale field, by v to some typical velocity, and the time unit is L over u. Then the dimensionless form of the induction equation is written as del b del t minus del cross v cross b minus 1 over rm, where rm is the magnetic Reynolds number that I was telling you about. And this typically tends to be a large number, a large number in uh, studies of uh, uh, many astrophysical and space plasma objects. Eta is typically a small number. And you find that Rm is very large. And those of you who are astute about mathematics know that when you have 1 over Rm, which is a small term that multiplies the highest spatial derivative in the problem, you're being set up to make mistakes, which you shouldn't, because one simple attitude could be, ah, 1 over Rm is a small number, so I'm just going to throw it out. Aha, can you really? Because that small number multiplies second order in b. So it is possible, though, in your system for the derivative of the system to be so large that if you take two derivatives, it becomes even large. So even though it's multiplying 1 over rm, a small number, because of the fact that you're differentiating b and that you're therefore getting to j, which can be very, very intense, the product of a small number and j can be a significant number matching other terms. This is at the heart of what is called boundary layer theory in asymptotic methods in mathematics that is, is a tool that hydrodynamicists and plasma physicists use galore. So a lesson learned from this that I hope you will always keep in mind. Always be suspicious if you have a small term that is multiplying the highest derivative in the equation. There's going to be funny behavior. And if you're not going to watch out, and you throw out that term, you lose a lot. So we won't make that mistake. We will keep it. And this is what I mean by saying is that the small scales with the narrow scales where j becomes very intense, then you have got to figure out what's going on on the small scales. And it may turn out that eta is not the most important thing. Now, there are other things, collision-less effects that come in and resolve those small scales. That is outside of the scope of MHT. But just be careful. Getting on, suppose if you ignore the velocity altogether. In other words, if this Rm is much smaller than 1, OK? And assume that this term is just negligible in that diffusion-dominated regime. This is where you're looking at a conductor. This is only decaying solutions. If you, this simply stands for the fact that if you have a metallic conductor and you give it a certain magnetic field and let it relax, be it copper or be it iron, it's eventually going to die. How will it, rapidly will it die? On this time scale, L square over eta. That's what I meant by saying that when you're estimating these diffusion time scales, what these are. Fortunately, for plasmas, that is not the purgatory they live in. Because if you write out this equation in the other limit, and I'm trying to give you a mathematically naive picture first, keep the diffusion term in one case, throw it out in the other, just to look at the extremities. So if you write out this term, the equivalent expression, if you simply do a little vector algebra with curl cross v cross b, is minus v dot grad b 
plus b dot grad v minus b del dot v. And the physics of these terms were actually implicit in some in the things that Dana told you yesterday in the context of the homopolar dynamo. This term simply represents the convection of the magnetic field, also referred to as advection. The green term is amplification by shear of the velocity field. And this one is the amplification through compression. The physical origin of the various terms is different, but they all play an important role in dynamo theory. So for V equals magnetic field, still motivating dynamos, magnetic field decays then on this time scale. And you and I revisited that time scale. What did we find? That those time scales are much smaller than typically than the time scales for which the magnetic fields are present. For Earth and other planets, the evidence for magnetic field on Earth, as I said, where tau d is 10 to the power of four years. Permanent rock magnetism, not possible because the temperature is well over the Curie temperature. And the field is highly variable. So the field must be maintained by some active process. And we are arguing the dynamo. The sun and other stars, the evidence is 300,000 years from beryllium aging. Most solar-like stars show magnetic activity independent of age. Indirect evidence for stellar magnetic fields over lifetime of stars. But it's worth keeping in mind that this is, their diffusion times are actually much longer. And I will leave you with this lingering thought, though I doubt very much that this is an answer. If you look at the answer of this billion years of tau d, you say, ah, three and a half billion, billion, factor of four. How precisely do you know these things? Primordial magnetic field could have survived in the radiative interior of sun, but really, so if you get out to the core, out to the convection zone, you know things are very turbulent. And are very unlikely that with such turbulent mixing, the estimates of resistivity that we have are valid. It's very likely that you have major enhanced resistivity, in which case that time scale is going to fall to the order of 10 years or shorter. Now, you can say, how are you certain about that? Because turbulent resistivity is sort of a, not a very precisely measured concept. What I can say, though, that for wherever this has been measured in laboratory contexts or otherwise, this has been a much larger number. OK, so here is your object, your eta, L, U. And I just wanted to make this list of the Earth, the Sun, the CERN turbulent conductivity, and liquid sodium lab experiment, which I won't be discussing. Look at the uh, magnetic Reynolds numbers and the characteristics numbers that you have. Dimensionless numbers for the Earth is 300. The Sun is this, humongous. With turbulence, it's uh, 100 liquid lab sodium experiments. And these are the tau diffusion. Lab experiments can teach you certain things. There's one, a very major one right now being built at Dresden that is in the process of producing some results. So we will have some good lab experiments, too. And the whole dynamo theory, therefore, is getting attention on multiple fronts, theory, high performance computing simulations, controlled laboratory experiments, and of course, nature herself, always a source uh, of great inspiration. So, and I want to get into a proper definition of dynamo. There are uh, and the reason why it is important to do that is because I want to separate out for you at the very outset what we call the small-scale dynamo from the large-scale dynamo. And let me do that separation. In all cases, in the very beginning, let's forget about the complexity of MHD equations. You do know that we need all of that in order to get a complete description. But let us, as I said, historically take the historical path. Forget about the complexity. Imagine you start out with a system where you have very, very small magnetic fields. And you're trying to understand what kind of convective motions would bring you to where the magnetic fields are now. This is what was called the kinematic dynamo problem. The kinematic dynamo problem was, I give you a seed magnetic field, and I let you choose your V. Be creative. 
You know what it takes to amplify a bee? You can think of uh, Dana's talk yesterday. He gave you certain ingredients. Imagine you had a choice of B. How are you going to measure success? Well, you will start out with this induction equation outside of curl region. Imagine you have a vacuum, all astrophysical and space objects are surrounded by tenuous media, which could be approximated as a vacuum. Across S, imagine that the jump of B goes to zero, and del dot B, of course, is zero. V is equal to zero outside of S, N dot V is zero, simple boundary conditions. So if you have the kinetic energy, it's half rho V square, and for a physical system, that's bounded from above. Finite amount of energy in the system. Mathematical definition of a dynamo is that if you have an initial condition B equals B zero, so that E magnetic can actually be of the order of or greater than the minimum energy E that is possible in the system. You could say that you have a dynamo. This is a very weak definition of the dynamo. This encompasses a whole lot of possibilities. If you just look at this and you say, isn't turbulence itself a form of dynamo then? Because roughly speaking, if B square and V square kind of comparable, they seem to have a dynamo. So why is dynamo any different from just having plain turbulence? A difference is, that in order to get that B to the level where it's even in equipartition with the velocity, you need an amplification process. So if you had a very weak magnetic field, then the task for you would be to say, how did you amplify this to bring it to this level in the first place? And imagine that the focus is now on energy. Now, if you have a magnetic field that's going up and down in time and space, right? It can be very, very low amplitude and is varying rapidly in time and space. That is energy. So if you amplify the energy, in principle, you have a dynamo. But whatever has energy doesn't necessarily have flux. What's the difference between energy and flux? Energy goes like B squared. How does flux scale? Tell me. How would you measure flux if you have a magnetic field in a certain volume, and I tell you what the flux coming out of the system is? Exactly. So that's B dot dA, right? But if that B actually varies in sign a lot across the surface, when you actually take the average, it'll go to zero, right? So if you have a very rapidly varying magnetic field in space and time, it can have energy, but it won't have flux. So if you're trying to understand the mystery of large scale magnetic fields, you must solve the problem of not only a field of finite energy, but also a field of finite flux over a certain volume. And this is what separates a large-scale dynamo from a small-scale dynamo. And beware of this in the literature, because people are not always telling you this ahead of time. And it's a, you go and read a paper, and somebody says, I've solved the dynamo problem. Look at it again. What problem did he or she solve? And in many cases, you will find that what they have, when they say they have solved the problem, they're not lying. What they're really saying is they solved the small scale dynamo problem. And how do you separate it out? Because you write the magnetic energy as sum of a mean plus a fluctuation. And now imagine you're measuring that magnetic energy and you're taking the average of it. So one part of it is B bar square, which survives. Another part of it is B prime square bar that survives. But the BB prime term, which you average over space and time, because it has a single B prime in it, when you average it out, it's going to go to 0. That's why the net energy is a sum of the squares of two terms. The small scale dynamo that I was just talking about generates very little mean field. It's mostly fluctuation energy. That's what we call the small scale dynamo. The large scale dynamo is B bar square much larger than B prime square. So almost all turbulent velocity fields are small scale dynamos for sufficiently large RLM. But large scale dynamos require additional large scale symmetries. And this is an important distinction to keep in mind. When I tell you that the dynamo problem is unsolved, what I really mean is that the large scale dynamo problem is unsolved. And that's the sole problem you want to solve. 
Because what you want to explain to people is how nature is producing her version of these large scale fields spontaneously from disordered small scale motion. If you think about it, it's a very counterintuitive idea because most of the time we think we start, it's like the idea of entropy. You know, entropy goes up in the universe. So if you have a large scale field, you think, ah, most of the time it's going to cascade into smaller scale and will be dissipated. And that's the usual way in which most natural magnetic fields would want to go. But what you're arguing, in fact, is that there is a spontaneous tendency for turbulence then to generate large scale order from small scale fluctuations, a very counterintuitive notion. Is this going to generally happen? Most of the time, not. It's turbulence of a special kind that has the burden of producing these large scale fields, and we'll make that more precise. So the dynamo problem in some way is a constrained turbulence problem. Not the run of the mill, not the picture that Stuart described to you, where you stir on the large scales and you go through a cascade and you have dissipation. That goes from large to small. What you're trying to do is to say, I have energy in the small scale, kinetic and magnetic, and out of that I want to generate large scale order. It's a hard problem. The sun knows how to do it. Here is a picture of the magnetogram of the sun, and Dana showed you a picture of this, a full disk magnetogram from SDO. What means large, small scale? Well, the sun has large scale fields, and these polarities that you see, negative and positive, those have definite fluxes. If you go to a much more granular level, you'll find plenty of those small scale fluctuations too. But the sun coexists producing its own large scale and small scale. And my emphasis in this lecture will be on the sun, though near the end of the talk, I'll get into um, some large scale motion. This is a very beautiful picture due to David Hathaway. And you actually saw this. And he looked at what happens to the large scale fields of the sun. And it shows in one fell swoop how, in fact, you see the 11 year cycle Things go away, the reverse sign. And what you're seeing here is on both hemispheres, large scale and small scales coexisting. And it's looked at 25 years of data to put together this picture. Right? So uh, an absolutely amazing problem. And this is all observations, right? Now it's left to theorists, poor theorists facing the burden of this sort of a thing, trying to explain how turbulence can generate one, large scale magnetic fields, and then this cycle. And it's work in progress. Believe it or not, some progress has been made. But in my mind, big questions still remain to be answered. So anyway, let's go back to the induction equation. And you see, what happened was that people said, Let's first try to understand the kinematic dynamo problem first, without worrying about the entire complexity of MHT equations. So they said, this is a problem we'd want to solve, the kinematic dynamo problem. I have a very weak seed. I want to amplify it to very large magnitude. And imagine you have the choice of a velocity field. What properties should that velocity field have? So they would say, OK, spectorially, this is what is called the stretch twist fold dynamo, take a loop, fold it, twist it. It does this. There are two pathways here. When you have a twist, then you fold it over again, and it falls here. But there's an enormous amount of tension that builds up in these corners, where the field lines are kind of reversed. If the plasma were completely ideal, and if it went through many such things, I mean, have you ever tried to take a loop of rope? Try to, or belt, try to twist it, fold it, twist it again, fold it. You'll quickly see how hard it is to go more than one set of folds. So if you don't relieve the tension of folding and the twist builds up hard at these corners, if you don't do something at the corners, you're going to stop. So an ideal plasma, that's what happens. It stops, but then reconnection, which I'll explain to you in just a minute in a few words, relieves that tension. 
and allows you to produce two loops that you can then repack and build up the magnetic field. Another way you could do it also is to just squeeze it, reconnect, and then repack. Both of these pathways do, through the intervention of reconnection, allows you to do this. Now, what is reconnection? Well, you're seeing amplification through field line stretching. It's like a rubber string. Extend it. You get amplification of the magnetic field. Twist it. And you need to repack it in order to build up the magnetic field to higher and higher strength. And reconnection is playing a role. Well, what is reconnection? Nobody has told you what reconnection is quite yet. And so I have to tell you what happens in reconnection. But reconnection is a very important process in plasmas. And this is no lecture on reconnection, so I'll have only three slides on it. If you have e plus v cross b equals 0, remember the dreaded equation I told you about, which has no dissipation on it? That's what Alfein, that's what Alfein uh, uh, talked about. And he wrote a theorem down. And as you know, he's the father of MHD. He's also the only plasma physicist who has ever gotten the Nobel Prize. And that is not because he was Swedish, I assure you. He fully deserved that. And I would argue that there are many plasma physicists who do. And they have been nominated. And some of them were in the fusion plasma business. And fusion is not a reality yet. So everything depends on how we solve these big and important problems. And plasma physicists do not have simple problems to solve. They solve complicated problems, which defy solutions like the turbulence problem or the reconnection problem, be that as it may. Alfein did get deservedly the Nobel Prize. And one of the things he did was to prove this theorem, is that if you have this equation, and this has no dissipation, and you have a loop, and magnetic field is threatening it, then you come to this picture. And he showed that the flux going through any of these loops would remain the same, no matter what the shape of the loop is. In a plasma fluid, if you have a dye, colored the plasma elements with dye, and let the thing evolve, it might become fiercely contorted as the things evolve. But the flux through it will always be constant. There's no change of topology that can be allowed in a system like this. But if on the right-hand side you have a term that has the property that the curl of R is not 0, and eta j, the term that I'm talking to you about, is such a term. Right? Eta is resistivity, and j is the current density. The curl of j gives you del square b, because j is curl of b. That's the term I was telling you about that we should worry about. Well, then field lines can do this. They can come together, they can relieve the tension, and they can go on. This is what is happening. And if this did not occur fast enough for dynamos, then you won't get the dynamo cycle to complete. Because you know we're stretching, twisting, folding all this stuff. And the tension is building up. But you've got to relieve the tension at these corners. So all the animal models, in some sense, rely on fast reconnection. In numerical codes, this is often done by numerical dissipation. But people need to understand this, that reconnection and dynamo go hand in hand. You have to understand fast reconnection if you have to understand large scale order of magnetic fields. This is why the understanding of fast reconnection, there are several reasons to study that problem. But to study uh, in the context of the dynamo, if you don't have fast enough reconnection, you can thwart the dynamo. In this talk and elsewhere, we, of course, we will assume that there is uh, fast scale dynamos possible. But I want to share with you one of the mechanisms by which fast scale dynamo can occur. And this is through what is called the plasmoid instability. And my colleague, Yimin Wong, uh, developed this rather nice movie, that if your field lines pointing in opposite directions that come together gradually, you see this extended current sheet over which the current density is becoming very, very strong. But notice then this spontaneously breaks up into what are called plasmoids, coherent structures, magnetic island types. And this thin current sheet is explosively unstable to what is now known as the plasmoid instability. You can calculate growth rates and everything. But the upshot of all of this is that this system by itself can evolve to a stage where the rate at which you chew up flux can become independent of the, of the magnetic Reynolds number, if you will. And that's important to get things to go fast, even when the Reynolds number is going high. Because in these systems, you have very, very large Lundquist numbers. I'm not going to uh, dwell on this issue at all. It just is that 
It's something that you should keep at the back of your mind, that if you are doing a simulation and you're studying turbulence problem, this is why I actually made the comment regarding Stuart Bale's talk, is that he separated in the heating picture, the so-called reconnection picture and the turbulent picture. But sometimes if you're examining small regions where the plasma is turbulent, you will see these current sheets, thin current sheets that are breaking up, provided your codes have enough resolution and if your Reynolds number is high enough. Is that growing fast enough? So on and so forth. These are questions. Now get back to the dynamo problem. There have been two classes of dynamos, the fast dynamos and the slow dynamos. The fast dynamos are those in which the rate at which stretch twist fold occurs is independent of the magnetic Reynolds number. And as I was pointing out to you, if reconnection is going slow in a way that falls off very slowly with RM, you're in trouble in getting a fast dynamo. A slow dynamo, on the other hand, the growth rate is limited by resistivity, and these also occur. A lot of the effort in dynamo theory for a long time was focused on this question, which is also a non-trivial question. I give you the induction equation. It has eta in it. You go to the limit of eta going small. Will the growth of B, growth rate, be independent of Rm or not? If it is, it's a fast dynamo. If it is dependent on Rm and falls off, it's a slow dynamo. Let me take a break here, and we'll return. OK, thank you. Let's keep the break small. I'm going uh, short because I'm going a little slower than I had hoped. But that's no problem, partially because so few said that you didn't know MHT, so I thought I would spend some time. Take a break. Thank you.
going on in this problem? It's easy to get slow dynamos. That's the thing. Put in a lot of diffusion, stay below the threshold, all your dynamos are going to be slow. You never understand why a billion years you have magnetic field. Slow dynamos are easy to get. Fast dynamos are not. Because they need condition. The connection must be no, on and on and on. Just a reminder to make sure you get enough water while you're before you start your flow change to sea level. Um, I'm a top of can I say one thing? Sure, please. So uh, in the back of the room, so I, I used to be in here for a couple of months, and then and I started bringing books out in my suitcase, and then, and then it got too heavy, so I started shipping books out, and eventually I just, my whole space is a shelf, and just dumped it into a box. So I've got, I've got my lending library in the back of the room, so feel free to browse, borrow that. I just ask that they be returned uh, uh, before you all leave today. Last night, in preparation for this lecture, I stole one of Nick's books. So I came in the morning, and I saw Nick nervously looking at his stack, saying, where did this book go that I had? And every one of those books have been read. Nick reads. You can see pages are marked. So. Uh, Take it, but return it. Uh, moving on. So I've told you about fast and slow dynamos. And uh, somebody was just asking me, uh, when do you get slow dynamos? That's the easiest to get. Run it at low, do the problem at low enough RM. Things will go resistively, but it's not going to solve the problem for you, because very few objects in nature can get their magnetic fields out of slow dynamos. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the sun. The dynamo problem, you have a sense of it. Why is the universe magnetized? For the purpose of this talk, now we are focusing on why is the sun magnetized? And so this picture I want to show you, of course, that you know, to remind you once again about what Dana already told you yesterday, there is a f core which is dominated by fusion reactions. And then you have an inner radiative zone. And then you go out to about 70% of the sun's radius, and the remaining 30% you have this convective zone uh, with what is called this taco cline, which is an absolutely remarkable object that is fascinating and made possible by great advancements in helioseismology. Seismology being, as you know, the subject where we can probe below the Earth's surface and learn about earthquakes. But the sun has its sun quakes too. But what is absolutely remarkable is that helioseismology, which has given us knowledge of sun, uh, which is a little bit more than skin deep, I think, has told us something absolutely fantastic, which is that between the radiative zone and the convection zone, there's a sharp layer. Why is that layer so sharp? It's not known. There is no theory for it. So the taco Klein remains an open object for us to resolve. And you have the convective zone where a lot of this convection is happening, and the magnetic field rises through a combination of buoyancy and other instabilities, rises to the surface, and out comes of the corona forming flux tubes, which you can model by vacuum fields or force-free fields of the kind that Dana was talking to you about yesterday. But the dynamo problem is at the heart of it, which is that we have to understand how these magnetic fields grow to coherent structures out in the convection zone. And let me tell you that the problem of dynamo in the sun is as yet one that has eluded a definitive solution. We all have grabbed on to pieces of it. And you will see some, I hope, really nice results from Nick, too, on where we are going forward with that. 
But what I'm focusing now is the solar convection zone, okay? Otherwise known as SCZ, but uh, the plasma is in convective motion. So you have the ingredients for the dynamo. And this is a picture of what goes on in the solar convection zone, the streamlines in the magnetic field that helioseismology has taught us. Right there at the lower BRAC boundary is where the tachocline is. I do not know why the tachocline is where it is, but it is there. We don't understand it, so how do people understand it? They just put a boundary condition that somehow there'll be very sharp gradients there. But how did those gradients come about? Why are they held in place by a radiative interior where the motion is dominantly radial to a convection zone where the motion has this character going from equator to the, the pole with the streamlines and the structures that you see? We don't understand it, but at least we can try to model it by saying somehow the gradients are such that they're driving the motion. So these are the streamlines, and what you really see is, and I'm going to show you some complicated equations, but don't be worried about the equations. You can always do math when you have enough time. What you need to understand is the basic idea. But I'm showing you the equations because I want you to see, get a feel for the structure of the equations and what the dynamo term does. So don't be too daunted. But let's first consider the following possibility, that the magnetic field has a phi component. The phi is the component along the annulus, perpendicular to the plane of the board, going round and round, and you're looking at just one sector of the magnetic field. So if the field is purely axisymmetric, and you assume that the velocity is entirely axisymmetric, then you can write the magnetic field vector and the velocity vector in this form. With, when magnitude of B represents the component along phi, and the one that is poloidal, that is on the plane, is represented by this term that goes like A. So the B vector you can construct if you know scalar B and A. Sorry, the scalar B notation is a little confusing because it doesn't represent the total magnetic field. It represents just a component of it. And velocity has radial and poloidal, and then also a rotation, a differential rotation, omega r sine theta in spherical polar coordinates. And suppose if you just wrote down in spherical geometry from the MHT induction equation and the momentum equation, and people who do simulations do that, these are the equations you will get. This is writing out uh, the two components of the magnetic field. And you have the velocity components also written out. The blue terms is what is called meridional flow, which is independent advection of poloidal and toroidal field. A, remember, was the component, just to remind you, B was the component to remind you. That's what I call in the toroidal field, the one that goes along phi. The one that is perpendicular in the plane is represented entirely by A. All that we are doing is to go into the induction equation and writing two equations for B and A. All right, look at the structure of the equations. Uh, you have the blue terms, you have differential rotation, the green term, source for the toroidal field, provide the poloidal field is not zero, and diffusion term. Now look at the equation governing A. Do you see whether there is any coupling between A and B? None at all, because this equation is purely an equation for A. So the poloidal component of the field then, left to itself, is just going to diffuse away. It doesn't matter you know, that you have this term there. If you can solve that equation, that del operator is just a Laplacian operator. It's a del square operator. This equation is going to just give you decaying solutions. So if you look at the problem, purely look at the problem of axisymmetric magnetic fields sustained by axisymmetric velocity fields, the field is going to die. In the context of the sun, this is what is called, you know, there are very few results in dynamo theory, it's Cowling's theorem. Cowling's theorem is actually not good news for dynamos. It's actually bad news for dynamos. So Cowling's theorem is an anti-dynamo theorem, which basically says that a stationary axisymmetric magnetic field with currents limited to a finite volume in space cannot be maintained by a velocity field with finite amplitude. In other words, this program that you or I are on are on are doomed to disaster. What you and I did very beginning to solve the dynamo problem is that we said 
Let's take an axis symmetric magnetic field, which the sun's magnetic field to a leading order is. But then we said, let's take a velocity field too, which is axis symmetric. Carling tells you you've got no prayer. You can solve all the equations you want. You're never going to get a dynamo out of it. Your solutions are going to decay. Therefore, a dynamo, and I won't go to the proof of it. It's actually done in Matthias Rempel's book, chapter 6. It's a few lines, but I'm a little short of time. So I want to tell you the main result, and you can reconstruct the proof yourself. So the symmetry of the system has to be broken in order for you to get around this. So you cannot hold an axisymmetric magnetic field by a purely axisymmetric flow. Forget it. Cowling kills you there, OK? So there's some history there. You know, uh, 1919, Sir Joseph Larmer w started worrying about this problem of magnetic fields. Solar magnetic field maintained by motions of conducting fluid. This is what Dana was trying to talk to you about yesterday. 1937, 18 years later, came Cowling's anti-dynamo theorem and many others. 1955, as is true of Parker in many other areas, he had a critical insight. He pointed out that if you write out the magnetic field in access symmetric and non access symmetric parts, he introduced what non access symmetry would do to the dynamo problem. By so doing, he got around Cowling. And he actually gave a physical picture of what that flow needs to do in order to produce large scale magnetic fields. Uh, it's one of Parker's most widely cited paper. I believe it is actually more widely cited than even his solar wind paper. And he told me a very, me and others, I'm sure you've heard this from Gene Parker, all of us are students in some way or the other. So Gene told me that anything that he's ever done in his life has always run into a refereeing problem. Uh, the solar wind paper got into deep refereeing trouble, and Chandrasekhar, who was the editor of Astrophysical Journal, overruled the editors to publish his papers. You know, things were good old boys those days. Chandrasekhar could walk into Parker's room and said, Parker, the referee says your paper stinks, but I can't find a mistake in it, so I'll publish it. Well, it was published. These days, most editors wouldn't do that. You know, the paper would be rejected. So it was true of his Dynamo paper. So Gene once told me a very interesting story. He said, you know, if you write a significant paper, you're going to have refereeing troubles. He said, once I wrote a paper which I thought was very ordinary, and I sent it in, and I got the referee's comments back, and they were terrible. So I thought, boy, this must be an important paper, far more important than I had ever thought. So uh, keep this in mind. If you get into trouble with the referees, maybe. Not everybody is a Parker, myself included. So any time I get into refereeing trouble, I don't fool myself that I've written a path-waking paper. But it's worth keeping in mind that if you rattle people, you're going to run into opposition. That paper, which changed dynamo theory, did run into trouble. Then 1964 is when Braginsky, Steinbeck, Krauss formalized Parker's idea in equations that came to be known as mean field theory. And in the last three decades, we've had a lot of simulations. OK, so what is this idea now? The idea of generating large scale magnetic fields from small scale fields. So suppose if you take the induction equation and you separate each quantity into mean plus fluctuation, average that equation. Are you with me? You can do this as you're sitting here. Mean B field to the left. On the right hand side, the bars are the mean quantities. And you generate this term, V prime cross B prime, which is a beating effect of two fluctuations. And that is what is called the turbulent mean field dynamo. So now what you have done, in a sense, is to create out of turbulence an effective electric field. As yet, we don't know what its properties are. But it's interesting that turbulence is doing that. And then if you subtract that mean field from the total B equation, you will generate the equation that is known below. I'm showing you the guts of the theory. That's what dynamo theory was for decades. Now, if you come to the second term, you see the difference of V prime cross B prime minus V prime cross B prime average. This is like the last two red terms. People who are doing dynamo theory, mathematicians, physicists alike, knew that term was trouble. So they said, you know, can do the complicated problem. These are fully rigorous equations. No assumptions yet. 
It would be great if we could solve them, but they knew that those two terms were trouble. So they just said, let's drop it. So we did the easiest thing. It was dropped. Now we can solve the problem. Yay. For decades, people just solved this problem. Um, prescribe a velocity field. Solve the B prime equation, which is a linear equation in B prime. You can solve it. Anybody can solve linear equations, right? Linear equations. If life were linear, that's what plasma physics or hydrodynamics kills you. Life is nonlinear. But you can solve the linear equation, then you plug it back in V prime cross B prime. Solve that problem. You have an equation for mean B field. Does the mean B grow or not? The mean B. The total B is still the mean plus the fluctuation. But the question is people are asking is, as in nature is, look at large scale structures and you have fluctuations. Can we get large scale growth out of that equation? Can this E miraculously produce that equation, produce growth? OK. So uh, sorry. I'm going to uh, skip the math a little bit. And what I'm going to tell you is that that term, that term that I just told you, E, which is the average of V prime cross B prime, the simplest assumption of that term is that it can, because the equation is linear in B, they can expand it using the scale separation between fluctuations and magnetic fields into a term that is linearly proportional to B plus another that is proportional to the derivative of B. And then there are higher order terms, the second derivative of B, mean B, and so on and so forth. But keeping these first two terms, you can go through a little bit of mathematics that all these people did. And what you end up getting is an equation of the kind that you see below here, which I won't dwell on. I'm going to just give you an overall result, which is that under certain conditions, that mean field E, which is generated as a product of two fluctuating quantities, can be written as alpha B where alpha is the so-called alpha effect, gamma cross B, which is like a convection term, beta called cross B. Beta reminds you of something else that you've seen before, eta. So turbulence can generate some kind of a turbulent resistivity, and so on and so forth. The rest are indices, algebraic quantities. But this alpha effect term that you generated that is parallel to B is what is the heart of kinematic dynamo theory. And what you found, in fact, is that if you have such a term that turbulence miraculously generates for you, then you are back in business. Because that turbulence can amplify your magnetic field. If you think physically what that is, is that as if the turbulence generated for you a turbulent electric field, E, script E, which has a component parallel to B. Think about E plus V cross B equals 0, your original ideal image de Ohm's law. E parallel is always 0. Now what you're doing is to say, turbulence is generating for you a component parallel to the mean B field. And in particular, the theory gave you expressions for it. And the one that I want to focus on is the term alpha. Because that's what is called the so-called kinetic helicity term, V prime dot omega prime, where omega is the vorticity. Aha, so now you know what will it take to produce an alpha effect that can potentially amplify your magnetic field. You must generate turbulence of a kind which has non-vanishing average helicity. I know I swept a lot of algebra under the rug for you here. But I want you to get the big picture, because in a talk like this, I cannot possibly do justice to all of this. For this, you go back and read Rempel's chapter, and he gives you all the steps. But you turn the crank. It's merely a question of turning the crank, nothing else. Uh, and you can do that in your spare time, or if you're interested in this field. So you get this alpha effect. So this is what is called the kinetic helicity. Now you see readily why two dimensions doesn't do it for you. Suppose you have a turbulent velocity field V lying in a plane. Take the curl of V, that's going to be perpendicular to the plane. That omega dot V, curl V dot V, is going to be 0. 
So 2D effects clearly have zero kinetic helicity, consistent with cowling. So in order for you, so axis symmetric magnetic fields in the sun cannot be maintained by axis symmetric velocity fields. That has V dot omega zero, omega being vorticity. But if you break the symmetry, you have a prayer. But a particular kind of symmetry too, systems that have, now the other one though, the turbulent resistivity, which is simply adding to the scalar resistivity, you can get anyway, whether it's 2D or 3D, but that doesn't help you. That just helps you dissipate the magnetic energy even speedier. You're not gonna get any generation by adding eta T to eta. You're getting generation because you produced an alpha. And Parker's picture was, in fact, this picture, that if you have a combination of stratification in a system, pure density averaging, rotation in the system, then you will get kinetic helicity in the system in the following manner. Here is the rotation axis, here is stratification. You can have two types of flows, depending on what the direction of your stratification is. If the stratification is such that your flow is going upward, then because of the uh, rotation and the stratification, the system will tend to it in this manner. If you're doing it on the other way, stratification, you still do this. Both actually produce a coupling of the magnetic field to the kinetic helicity. Here you're seeing a picture whereby that magnetic field is coupling into this, producing essentially a strengthening of the magnetic field in the uh, direction of the red arrow, uh, giving you amplification of the magnetic field. And now going back to those convection equations that were doomed to failure, if you have an alpha effect, then you get this alpha B term. Now the A equation is coupled to the B equation to the presence of this term. Therefore, in the absence of this term, this thing was decaying away. In the presence of this term, which is coupling its to toroidal rotation driven by the sun's rotation itself, you have a way of anchoring it. So as a combination of differential rotation and turbulence, you've actually generated this term. And it turns out the presence of this term by itself can give you amplification, provided you have the turbulence of the right kind. Okay, what is turbulence of the right kind? Something with alpha. People said, I can come up with all these flows with non-vanishing alpha. I have solved the dynamo problem. Great. For a long time, we went in thinking the dynamo problem is solved. And people who are trying to fit magnetic fields to parameters went ahead and did a whole lot of fitting, beginning from the galaxy to the planets. You give me an alpha and you give me a beta, I can fit every magnetic field on Earth. You know, again, to quote Gene Parker, give me three parameters and I can fit the Manhattan skyline. Well, physicists did that. But the whole question was, and this is what computer simulations got us into trouble again, because, I'm sorry, I'm going to move on, is that now you got this induction equation, you got the alpha effect, and you ask yourself, I want to go back and do the fully self-consistent problem. I can do that analytically. So let me start out with the flow that has kinetic helicity, and I couple it to all my momentum equations, and people therefore wrote MHD codes to try to solve and understand the dynamo problem. So suppose if I start out with a weak magnetic field, in the very beginning it has the right kinetic helicity, I generate an alpha, but as the magnetic field grows in strength, remember the momentum equation? It's got a Lorentz force term, J cross B. We were neglecting this so far. What if you bring that momentum equation and solve the whole set of equations self-consistently? What will that do to act back on the kinematic alpha effect? Well, you'll get a correction term, like J prime cross B prime. Guess what? What people found was that if you did a closed system and you ran it for a while, you begin to see some amplification, but soon, the back reaction of the magnetic field would stop your alpha from being significant. In fact, in fully self, many self-consistent simulations, the mean magnetic field hardly grew to any significant magnitude before the back reaction of the Lorentz force quenched the alpha. 
This is what we learned in the last so many years of mean field dynamo theory. And that was known as the crisis in dynamo theory. Therefore, what happened? What about what the fact that we made sense of all these magnetic fields by fitting alpha and beta and choosing alpha and beta to be whatever fancy forms we want? Well, in self-consistent MHT, that alpha, in many cases, was seen to be suppressed. And the quenching could be understood, actually, due to a very nice paper by Anik Pouquet. Anik, who headed the turbulence program in NCAR for many years, told me that this is her best paper ever. And she wrote this when she was a young person with Uriel Frisch and others. What she actually found was that, remember this term, omega prime dot v prime? You know this term. Out of kinematic dynamo theory, you got this term. And that's what was giving you the alpha effect. What Anik found from perturbation theory is that the Lorentz force term gives you a correction to this term. And that's that, j prime dot b prime is omega dot alpha v prime. Look at them. They have opposite signs. So the back reaction, if this becomes significant, can be such as to nearly cancel this term out under certain conditions. And if you think that turbulence is like Alfen waves, as Stuart Bale was telling you, whereas V is proportional to B, take the curl of both sides of the equation. What do you get? Curl of V is omega is proportional to J. What is interesting is that the back reaction of the Lorentz force, if turbulence is mostly Alfen waves, can produce near cancellation of the alpha effect. So the gold rocks with the turbulence and all this turbulence that we were talking about actually has negligible dynamo effect. Now, obviously, it's possible to get around this because the cancellation is not perfect. You can put in helicity to the boundary, and you can do all kinds of funny things, and you can keep the dynamo going. And I'm not saying that those are not right things. They can actually occur. But it's good to confront the fact that in order to understand dynamo theory, not only do you have to understand the kinematic dynamo to mean field induction, but also the back reaction to the momentum equation that gives you that term. And whatever alpha it is that you're finally happy with should survive all of this. And uh, I feel, therefore, that I, I should uh, tell you what the challenges to kinematic dynamo theory were. And I want to summarize it, is that the smallest scales grow most rapidly. I'm now describing to you some of the crisis that we have gotten ourselves in. And we are getting out of it now, because we are invoking additional effects that access helps us get out of it. But I do not want to give you the impression that the problem is solved. One thing that happens if you do simulation or theory, and Kalsford and Anderson did a nice theory, Baldi Rev later on, is that you start out with the induction equation, you will find, in general, that the small scales grow very rapidly. So even if you're starting out with a flow in which the seed magnetic field is very small and small scale, the first thing to grow are those fluctuations. They become very, very large. Then the mean field comes along. Uh, but the small scale fields act back to decrease the large scale field drastically. This is the problem of catastrophic quenching that I was referring to you about. But this challenge could be addressed by transporting helicity. And there are a whole bunch of papers written in the astrophysical literature by Blackman, Field, and others, and Axel Brandenburg in the solar physics community. People here have done a lot of good work trying to get around this problem of catastrophic quenching. But I want to tell you that this problem is by no means a solved problem yet. At even moderate RM, the fast-growing small-scale dynamo implies that velocity fluctuation should always be accompanied by magnetic field fluctuations of a similar magnitude, questioning the relevance of classical kinematic theory. We have come to seriously question how much we can rely on classical kinematic theory to make a predictive theory of the dynamo that will be applicable to a whole range of problems. Now, I have about 10 minutes, and I want to talk to you about astrophysical object, which is a little outside of the scope of Rempel's chapter 6. But I do want to talk to you about it, because I want you to see that the problem has had some possible solutions. And this was done by a former graduate student of mine, 
uh, Jonathan Squire, who is now in Caltech. But just like in the solar dynamo case, you have these problems on the challenges. And I'm telling you problems as well as ways in which we get around it. And we'll hear more from next lecture. The accretion disk dynamo, too, had similar problems. Now, the accretion disk is not observed as the sun is. That's a great thing about the sun. It's the first, some people call it a boring star. I call it a typical star. But what the sun is, it gives us remarkable information about so many things that we could use as a basis for embarking into other astrophysical objects. Now, with the accretion disk, all we know is there are magnetic fields. And we think that there is large-scale magnetic fields. Because without large-scale magnetic fields, we would not understand the momentum transport problem that occurs in an accretion disk, whereby, as you know, in the black hole, the objects get sucked in. And as you go in, there's a disk which is spinning awfully fast, which is magnetized. And it has jets which go off of this form. And the question is, why is the accretion disk have a large-scale dynamo? There, the question is similar to what we ask for the sun. Now, What is interesting is that when people do simulations of the accretion disk, and now there are legions of them. My colleague, Jim Stone at Princeton, is a master of these things. He has a code called Athena. He puts in sheared flow in the accretion disk, that flat disk that you saw. And when he runs his code with reasonable parameters, what he gets actually, the growth of a large-scale magnetic field. So you can say, well, I can't observe it in the accretion disk. But I can surely get computer codes to do that. The computer codes are producing from turbulence large scale growth. But they have an ingredient, namely that there is shear flow in the system. So even if we do, cannot probe the accretion disk, we at least have the numerical experiment. We can say, what explains then that in this numerical experiment, you're seeing large scale growth emerge out of turbulence? Make that your problem. Undoubtedly, the alpha effect that I told you about and all the suppression, those are still questions for the accretion disk. Why is it then that the simulation is producing a large-scale magnetic field, despite the fact that the alpha effect can be quenched? Well, this is from Jacob Simons, one of Jim Stone's collaborators. You can try to do it on the torus. That's too hard a problem to do to numerically resolve. So what they do is that they take a slab out of it. And they call it a stratified shearing box. And they put in a lot of resolution and try to study that. I won't tell you what the details of shearing box, boundary conditions, and everything. Those are mathematical things. Let's assume that technically we have solved those issues. What we're trying to do is to understand how, in the presence of sheared flows, you can get large scale growth. Turns out even the compressible MHD equations are too hard. So you do an unstratified shearing box. But this is what happens. You do see large scale growth in these systems. So, here you see large scale magnetic fields growing in the system out of turbulence, which are larger scale than the scale of the smallest fluctuations in the system. And we want to study this turbulent electric magnetic field there. So this is what was Jonathan Squire's primary result. And it tells you it was an astonishingly surprising result for me anyway. We both embarked on this problem, and none of us knew anything about the accretion disk when we started. And maybe that's why we found a new result. So I just want to tell you that he actually got the uh, Marshall Rosenbluth dissertation prize for actually uncovering a possible mechanism on why the accretion disk dynamo actually works. But let me now tell you what his primary result was. He actually found a new effect, which he called the magnetic shear current effect. And in this problem, he set up the initial conditions in such a way that the alpha was 0. In fact, for him, there was no kinetic helicity in the system at all. What he did, though, is to study the nature of dissipation in the system. And what he found out was that E equals two terms, say, alpha b plus beta j. Alpha is set equal to 0, but the beta is actually a tensor. The diagonal elements cause you dissipation. But there are off-diagonal elements that can actually cause you amplification. And he showed, in fact, that there is an anisotropic negative resistivity that can give you dynamo growth. And this is sustainable only if the system has sheared flow. And this is, in fact, 
from his physical review letters. Uh, this work was primarily his work. I was a sparring partner, but the insight was his. So I want to absolutely make clear that you realize this was done primarily by my graduate student who taught me a lot in the process. So what he's doing here is doing a lot of simulations here of the so-called magnetic shear current effect. And he's looking at the magnetic field fluctuations. What he found, in fact, in the process of evolving, and you see all these curves? He did thousands of simulations to get statistics. And what he found in general, after he averaged all of them, is the system had a time period when there was small-scale dynamo growth. But remember the picture that we had of alpha quenching? The small-scale dynamo was the one which pushed your magnetic flick fluctuations to grow very rapidly, quenching your alpha effect. What John found, in fact, is that truly that the magnetic field fluctuations grew much more rapidly than the mean magnetic field. But eventually, the small-scale magnetic field saturated and drove the large-scale magnetic field to grow to significant amplitudes, driving it on a longer time scale. So you had to do a long-lasting simulations in order to see that magnetic fluctuations were actually driving the large-scale growth. So he put dynamo theory in his head because where we were before, we were saying, oh, the small-scale fluctuations, they're a nuisance. They completely overcome any mean field growth. And the mean field is just growing too slowly, and you get alpha quenching and all of that. And he said, wait, let the magnetic field small-scale saturate. They then provide magnetic noise for you to actually drive your large-scale growth. And here, what you see here, and to do that, he didn't solve the problem for the sun but he tried to solve the problem for the accretion disk in which there was sheared flow. Without sheared flow, you do not get this effect. But in the presence of sheared flow, what he found was that the magnetic spectrum would typically grow and would become this dotted line would be this broad base fluctuation. But in the presence of sheared flow, Keplerian flow, he found that in fact you get large scale magnetic field growth of the size of the box. This was the major finding of his result. And then he did perturbation theory in limits of small Prandtl number and small Reynolds number. And he checked it out that, in fact, in those limits, which are not directly applicable to what the accretion disk is, at least the mathematical theory produces a result which is consistent with the numerical simulations. So therefore, I want to end this lecture leaving that thought in your mind. And I am not suggesting that this is by any means yet the solution of the solar convection problem. But there is a very interesting paper by Hotta and Rempel that intrigues me greatly. John Esquire did not apply, uh, sorry, um, did not apply his theory to uh, Hotta and Rempel. But I want to end you with that thought, since uh, I started so much borrowing from uh, Matthias's work that this uh, paper, if you look at it, Hotta, Rempel, and Yokoyama, they are doing a hero simulation of the solar convection zone. And one of their findings is that in that simulation, they make no connection to the magnetic shear current effect. That's just a question that I'm raising, that you have to resolve both the small scales and the large scales simultaneously in one simulation in order to understand what the dynamo effect is. If you miss out on one, then you won't get the other. And I just want to raise the following question. Is it possible that in these simulations, the small scale growth which they retain provide large scale magnetic field growth on a longer time scale? But somehow, if you ran simulations in which you ill resolve the small scales, you will never see the beneficial effect that arises from the small scale. As to whether in the solar convection zone that is what is driving magnetic field growth remains an open question. That's all I have to say, and thank you very much. <laughs> Finished at noon. Questions? Yeah. No, no, 
I just mean uh, in the classical kinematic theory was just purely on the induction equation. And the induction equation is just one of all the MHT equations. So I was saying do a more complete theory, keeping the momentum equation, the continuity equation, it's just a full scale of MHT equation. Kinematic and dynamo theory solves the following problem. Choose the V and calculate how B grows. That's the kinematic problem. But then as B grows, Lorentz forces become significant. The momentum equation will kick in. If you artificially exclude that, then you're not taking into account the back reaction of the Lorentz force on the system. We are very, very far away from quantum dynamos. Forget it. I don't even know what systems I can suggest to you where this would be important. Quantum turbulence, yes. There are a number of superconducting media, and they are doing superconducting vortices and stuff like that, but not so much the dynamo problem. Sure. But it seems to imply that the cross time might actually be important, but it also implies that the shearing at the top of the convection zone is actually important. And what I'm going to say to you, the solar convection zone has shear in it. However, the kind of flows that we have in the sun, which we know to be observationally important, are more complicated than what we have worked with accretion disks. And therefore, more things are happening in the solar convection zone than Jonathan Squire's thesis actually deals with. What we have to figure out is whether, once you take the complexity of the convection physics, as you say, the magnetic shear current effect is in fact playing an important role or not. I do not think I'm willing to say at all. But the very fact that in the simple Keplerian flow, it did turn out to have an important effect. And my fond hope is that he will do this problem for his PhD thesis, but we'll see about that. Um, so in the fact that you're actually saying some of what you are saying could be happening in the solar convection zone, you're actually saying something that I'm hoping is the case. But we should really study it in the context of the sun because the nature of the flows and the parameters of the sun are rather different. And we have learned from experience not to extrapolate too far. Yeah, please. question. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, we didn't examine the, the two levels of your question. One is, is magnetic helicity really important for accretion disks? If you look at the literature, the answer is not clear. In other words, they have done flows without uh, uh, much helicity and done flows with helicity. Doesn't seem to make much of a difference. The results turned out to be reasonably good no matter what. But I think that's too that we too glib a dismissal of the importance of helicity. And we certainly haven't examined the question of helicity in the context of the shear current dynamo, unsolved problem to be looked at. And we know for sure that in the sun, helicity is important. So I think that that consideration must play a role that we must deal with in the SCZ. OK, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.